<laughs> it's great if you can get it. I know that Maggie Escrava from Texas, a Houston uh, rescue, uh, has used paws and pilots. She's posted a lot of pictures of that. I have not successfully been able to get anybody up here to, to do that for us, but basically a lot of the times these pilots are looking for extra hours to complete their certifications and they're happy to take a dog along and pick them up and, and bring them uh, back and forth. So that's a good way to get a dog that's not that close to me here. Um, so transport of different types. Um, home visits, not uh, a minimal thing. If I can't be everywhere all the time, but if somebody is willing to do a home visit for me and then contact me, um, I, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at these messages here. Um, if, if somebody's willing to do a home visit for me, let's say um, in Connecticut, while I'm doing one in Pennsylvania, uh, that means I can get that dog into the home in Connecticut faster if all goes well. And I don't have to wait till I have the time to then go to Connecticut. So the, the, uh, the more we can multitask, the better off we are, the more we streamline our process. Um, oh, Maggie's on, I guess. And she says, you can post transport needs on pilotsandpaws.org. <laughs> Thank you, Maggie. Um, next, Matt. We can use volunteers to pick dogs up for animal, from shelters and animal control facilities. Again, that way we can get somebody out there faster. If an animal control facility calls me, they don't even have a shelter. They just have a couple of pens out back often. And they'll say, we got a Scotty. Scotty's sick. Scotty's got no hair, whatever, can you come and get them? If we don't get there fast, we don't know what's gonna happen with that dog. So if somebody can do it for us and we can just pick up the phone and say, hi, I've got somebody in Pennsylvania that's uh, you know two towns away, um, we can get the dog and then maybe they can hold the dog overnight until I can get to their house. So um, picking up is, uh, is also really helpful. Participate in auctions and other sales venues. Obviously, uh, and Vicki has covered this already, that's one of the ways that we bring in money to pay for the rescue bills, to pay for the gas, to pay for boarding, to pay for food, um, to pay for the supplies that they need. And, um, uh, and, and so anybody who's gonna buy something anyway, buy it from one of our auctions and support us in our mission. Sorry for the barking. Uh, <laughs> Hope it's can uh, next slide. Okay, thanks, Matt. If you like our Facebook page, you'll be on. Um, you'll be able to see what we're doing at any time, and that will be helpful to you. And it could be helpful to us. Might be that you like a dog that we've got posted for adoption. It might be that you see we put out a request for foster homes. It might be that we put out a request for a specific dog to get certain kind of funding because they need a very expensive operation. So it's good for you to be on our page and see what we're doing. Uh, so here are the two pages that you could like and be uh, participating. This is a very big one. I don't want to gloss over this. I know it's controversial, but don't bombard the shelters and animal controls or, or share dogs all over social media to people who will likely not actually help the dog. Instead, privately email or message appropriately located rescue groups so they can mobilize the right help. If you tell me there's a dog in, um, in upstate New York that's in a shelter and it's all over all the chat groups, everybody's calling. Whether they want the dog or not, they're calling. They're calling to find out about the dog. They're calling to find out um, how long they've been there or I don't know, whatever, they just wanna find out. They wanna share that information back with their group and their friends. And that's really a great thing to do. But what happens is a lot of these shelters are, are managed by maybe two people. And if they are answering the phone for one dog and they may have 200 dogs, if they have phone going off the hook for one dog and people are not saying I'm coming in and taking the dog, 
they will they will take that dog off pet finder we will not know who what's going on we won't even know the dog is there or they're going to get really nasty with everybody but you can be sure that when i call i won't get through and i'm going to be the one who's going to take that dog and put them in a foster home and give them the medical care they need so i can find them a good home and get them in good shape so it would be much better if you called me or looked on our stca.biz website and found the appropriate one in the appropriate state, contacted them and let them handle it because that's what they want to do. That's what they're geared to do. Uh, the last thing is check for regional Scottish uh, Scotty rescuers at this site. The STCA, Scottish Terrier Club of America has kindly given us a, a page where they can refer um, uh, reputable rescuers. Uh, I, I guess make it available for people to look and, and find one. Um, I do maintain this list with the um, STCA web team. So those phone numbers, uh, websites and uh, Facebook pages, whatever we can fit in there for the organization uh, should be up to date. So please feel free to check there. If you see a dog on Petfinder and they're in California, I don't mind you contacting me, but it probably would be faster if you contacted California Rescue. There's two of them listed. Golden Gate, Scottish Terrier Rescue covers one section. And, um, uh, and then there's uh, Carol Hurd, for example, who covers the other. And, uh, and you can contact them and they probably have all kinds of um, relationships set up with those shelters. So they can get that information quick and get something done for the dog faster. Um, uh, next slide, please. Vicki. So people, people, as they're looking, they'll see on the STCA site, there's not always a rescue group listed in that state. And it can be several reasons for that. Like what happened in my area, the rescue person moved to Tennessee. If I hadn't taken it over, there might not be anybody in Missouri. So the, the former rescue director in that state might have retired with no replacement in line. Um, it can happen that there's lack of funding or support. It's expensive. If you don't have a, a good support system, it would be impossible to do this job. I am very, very fortunate in, in my volunteer support system and in, in our uh, just regular uh, supporters that help out financially because it can be very experienced. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I took over with $33. And for the first couple of years, all of the vet bills were paid out of my own personal pocket because the adoption fees didn't cover it. So um, it, it, it can be um, a, a pretty daunting task for people to take on. And as we've mentioned, it's, it's totally volunteer. We're not paid to do this, but if people don't volunteer to help, we can't do it without everybody. I was gonna sit and, and make a list of all my volunteers. And then I thought I'll leave somebody out because we do have a huge support system, a huge, huge group of, of foster homes, huge group of people that transport, huge, huge group of people that have offered to transport that I haven't even had to use yet. So it's always nice to volunteer because you never know um, where the need is gonna be. Uh, next, Matt. So just to give you a little uh, a knowledge about Erica and, and St. Louis Scottish Terrier Rescue, we cover Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Central and Western Arkansas, Western Kentucky, Eastern Kansas, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. We basically cover most of the Midwest. And you know, if, if there's help needed in another state where where nobody else is available. If I can work something out with either like Pilots and Paws or some of the people that I know um, in other states um, that can help out, we do it. We took in a Scotty from Utah and, and that was just an odd thing. Um, 
mainly because I was good friends with a Basset Rescue. They got in a Basset Hound and a Scotty. And eventually she said, I really want your group to take the Scotty. So we managed to ground transport to Colorado and then air transport to Kansas City. And um, so we will work out wherever we have to. Way back when Erica was really active in in uh, mobilizing the team out here in the United States, she would contact me and she would say, hey, Vicki, there's a dog in uh, Arizona. And I would give her a hard time and, and tell her she was geographically challenged. But we have found out that we can, we can uh, make connections, you know, if we really want to. So Stigney covers the Northeast and Middle Atlantic states in between adjacent groups in New England and Maryland and will help states where there isn't any coverage. They do their best, but, or we do our best, but it's not always possible to mobilize the help needed to get a dog out long distance and into the hands of someone capable of helping. And we do leverage the Scotty Rescue Network across the United States and other volunteers across the country to take care of the dogs in need. Next. Okay, Erica. Okay, finally, um, how can you tell if a rescue is legitimate? I think if you, you know, you can do your best uh, and hopefully by at least following these things, you can weed out some of the ones that are obviously a, a, a problem. Ask how the dog came into rescue. You really have to wonder when you see some of the dogs and the situations and the conditions that they're in, how did they come to you? you know, if, if that was a reputable route. Uh, stick with the rescue that has a known reputation. If you adopt from our group, we're from Vicki's group, you know, everybody knows who we are, where we're, that we're here, that we've done this for a long time. You know, you can feel comfortable with that, hopefully. <laughs> uh, what is the rescue's rehoming policy? Should the adoption not work out? You don't want to deal with somebody who's going to just drop the dog and run. You want somebody who cares enough about the dog and is invested in that dog to, um, uh, and in their contract, will take the dog back should things not work out. And should things not work out, meaning not just that the dog's on a trial basis with you, because we've got different programs. There are trial programs. There's foster to adopt programs. There's um, you know, different programs that we can use, but we want to make sure that should 10 years down the line, that dog, that person has to go into a nursing home, that they can contact us and we'll take that dog back. And we will, and we want to, we want that dog back in our program. We don't want that dog in the shelter. So um, there are plenty of places that will just drop the dog and run and you can't get in touch with them. You can't call them back. Uh, they maybe even haven't given you any information about the dog and or any real information about the dog. So, you know, you don't know what you're getting. Um, Google their organization and look up their charity status. You can actually look up online and, uh, and find out information about the organizations and even what some of the um, reviews have been on them. Um, whether they've had good reviews. There's actually some websites that are just for complaints and you can look up those and see if, if, if any organization that you're dealing with has complaints against them. You, look, you can look up their charity status. Here's an example on the right of Vicki's 501c3 acceptance letter. Um, if you are applying for 501c3 charity, uh, non, uh, it's a tax exempt status. You have to go through a lot of uh, paperwork to prove that you are worthy of getting this status. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of questions. It's a large packet that you have to fill out, a lot of questions, a lot of things that you have to agree to do and not do. They have to understand what your mission is. Um, and then uh, they also charge quite a, a lot of fees for it as well. So, and, it, and somebody reviews this and goes through it. And then every year you're responsible for filing taxes appropriately and for keeping your um, uh, charitable uh, status 
current in each state that you operate if if that's you know your the, the way you want to do it um we keep it uh, in, in the state that we're incorporated in but in i know vicky is doing it in different states as well uh, so you can look these things up uh, and see if they really are charity and really are 501c3 you can actually go to places like guide star and there probably are, are some other uh, places you can look up and see. Um, somebody had brought up a question last, I think it was earlier in the week, um, just because the, the person, the club or the group has a 501c3 paperwork like this one says February of 2010, you know, they could have um, not, they could not be uh, current with that. And maybe they aren't 501c3 anymore. Just having it doesn't mean you're maintaining it. You can look them up online and see if they are listed current as a charitable organization in that state. You can find out the vet the rescue uses and call for references and see what kind of job they do with their dogs and see what the vet's office feels about their organization. I had a person that was from um, a similar breed rescue uh, that my vet told me she was terrible. They, they, they did not do what was necessary for the dogs. Um, and they didn't even really like her as a client. She didn't pay her bills. And he, you know, these are things you can find out often from, uh, from the, uh, the vet's office. If you can find out who they use, it's not always uh, obvious. And they may not want to tell you, but you can always ask. Uh, check website for reviews and experiences. There are people that adopt and will be kind enough to come back and say, I had a great experience adopting a dog from a particular rescue group and put that on their Facebook page or put that on their website. Um, people who have um, uh, difficult experiences, they can also put them in um, multiple review sites, even maybe Yelp. I mean, you know, things that you see all the time, there's a lot of them out there and, um, and they can be really helpful in telling you about the place that you're getting your dog from or you're con contemplating getting a dog from. Um, what kind of medical and temperament evaluations have been done? You really need to ask that kind of information up front. Ask them what kind of records you're going to get if you adopt that dog. You want to make sure you're getting things like vaccine records, spay neuter certificates, um, blood work, um, heartworm Lyme tests, stool samples to tell if they've got worms or any other kind of par internal parasites. You, you're going to have to do whatever they didn't do. So you want to get that information from them. If they have none to give you, you have to really wonder, what are you getting? You're taking a chance. I'm not saying you shouldn't adopt the dog and help the dog out if you can do it, but you are taking a chance that you are getting a dog that may have something that's very expensive. It could even be something that's very terminal. Um, as far as temperament evaluations, it's really important to have somebody who spends time living with the dog before they go out to you. Otherwise, you don't know anything about what they're going to be like with you. They could have fears. They could have aggressions. Um, they could not get along with other dogs and you have another dog or you could have a dog that's that's in a weakened condition and you're bringing home a new dog and that dog could kill them. You really need to, to find out what's been tested. If you have cats, ask them if they've, if they've uh, done any tests with cats. If they can, they will. If they've tested them with other dogs, if they've tested them with men and women and children and um, on a leash and, and, uh, and off a leash and uh, in a park and, you know, when we have them in foster, we do all these things with them to see how robust they are, to see what they can do. We take food away from them. We take toys away from them. We try different things. And um, if we tell you something, then you can be pretty sure that we've tested that. And that's what we're trying to, to do a match on. We obviously care about where the dog ends up. So that's why we go through all the screening process and evaluations and all the medical work. So when you talk to us and you're gonna find out all kinds of things about the dog and that's gonna show you that we've taken the time to, to do all these proper assessments to make sure this is gonna be a good match. If a person that you're trying to adopt from 
doesn't ask you any questions, doesn't have an application, doesn't ask you if you have young children at home, if you have other pets, doesn't ask you to bring things in, um, they, uh, bring your dog in to meet that dog, then they really don't care. They just want to get the money and get the dog out of there. So who does the testing on these things? Typically the foster home will do the testing for you. You have to choose fosters that are capable of doing those things and following your directions. Um, and uh, there are times that um, even we will go over to the foster home and actually do that ourselves. So, but if the, um, in the rescue groups, let's say in a shelter, they have somebody whose job it is to actually test. Uh, um, they, they have a, a certain, I can't remember what the name is, but there's a certain test that they do and they pinch the dog and they take food away and they bring another dog in and they do all these things and then they come up with an evaluation. And those things I find are actually very annoying to the dogs. So it's not going to necessarily be like, I'm never going to pinch a dog and twist it and see if he's going to bite me. I mean, that's not something that I feel is like very real life. But um, um, if my foster mom says to me, the dog loves to sleep in bed with me, he's real cuddly, he's real this and so, you know, then I'm going to be looking for a home where a person wants to sleep in bed with the dog that's going to be cuddling with them. That's that wants a dog that's cuddly. So, so. Those, those, so we, we do, I really rely on my foster homes to help me. And I speak to most of them almost every day to find out what's new while they're fostering, what's going on with those dogs. Um, many of them don't change that much in between. So we keep in touch with them frequently, but um, you know, things can change as they're in there for a while. And those are things that may make a difference while we are evaluating people. It could take a month to find the right home. It can take months to find the right home. Um, I have a dog in foster right now. He's been there three or four months um, that I thought was going to be a real easy placement. And she is not because she's dog aggressive. And um, we just have not had the right people apply. But I don't want to make a mistake for her. So I'm not placing her until I get the right home. And I'm basing a lot of that information on, on the foster mom who's living with her. And she also comes and visits with me too. So I do, I do keep in touch, but um, how will the dog be transported to you? If you're getting a dog from a place that is in another part of the country and they're sticking a whole bunch of dogs on a tractor trailer, I, I don't want to do that to the dog. Um, and I don't think it's safe. So you really need to see how you need to decide for yourself, obviously, but if they're on a tractor trailer with a whole bunch of other dogs that it could be sick, maybe the dog is a puppy. Maybe the dog isn't strong enough to make it from the other part of, part of the country to you. You really need to figure that out before you get that dog. I see them listed all the time. This dog is listed in a shelter in New Jersey. And then when I call, it turns out the dog is really in Texas or Missouri or something. So they're, they're far away from here. And I don't understand why they aren't placing the dogs there. So um, you need to see, are they just trying to ship the dogs up here so that they can make money? Um, or are they concerned about the dog's safety? Uh, have they been spayed, neutered, vaccinated, et cetera? Typically, most legit rescue groups are going to spay and neuter um, and vaccinate all dogs that are um, capable of, um, oh, I'm sorry, I think I'm running over here, uh, that they're capable of, um, of being done at that time uh, based on their health and their age and, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, how long has a dog been in foster or have they ever been in foster? If the dog hasn't been in foster and nobody's evaluated the dog, nobody's lived with the dog, you're taking a lot of chances. Um, it doesn't mean the dog doesn't deserve to have a new home, but uh, you know, you, you, you probably do better going to somebody who does take the time. Well, what kind of records will you get with the adoption? I mentioned that before. You want to get vet records. You want to get any kind of temperament evaluation. You would like to get an owner turn-in document if you can, a questionnaire that they give to the owner to ask 
about a lot of things living with the dog. Were they good with certain things? Were they good with kids? Did they bite somebody? Why did you turn them in? Were their house broken? Those kind of things are very helpful in you making your decision if that's an appropriate dog for you and your lifestyle. How long has the organization been in business? It, many of these places are popping up all over the place and they're getting 501c3s, but they really don't have experience. So you have to take that into consideration too. Some people are great at it and this is their first time, or let's say they were doing this and now they split out and they were doing it for a club and they split out, went on out on their own. So they're new out on their own, have a different name, but they've got experience. So you wanna ask, or at least try to look up and see and find, find out that information. Is the organization associated with the National Breed Club? Not every breed, not every even breed rescue is associated with the National Breed Club. We are in Scottish Terrier Club of Greater New York Rescue are, are one of the 20 something um, uh, regional branch clubs of the National Scottish Terrier Club of America. But um, there are a lot of places that don't have enough people to have a club or they're just too spread out. And even in Vicki's case, it's an, it's an independent rescue. So that doesn't mean that hers is any less you know, um, uh, you know, solvent or legit than mine is. But if you know that they're at least associated with them, you know that, that they're, they're, they do have some legitimacy, some more legitimacy. Vicki's group is an independent group, for example, but they're listed under the Scottish Terrier Club of America website. So, um, uh, I have a question here. Does, does um, the rescue have liability insurance coverage for volunteers? If you are 501c3, you're essentially a, a LLC, Limited Liability Corporation, and there is a, a limitation to, um, to what, uh, what kind of um, uh, suing can be done, what kind of um, things can be um, uh, what kind of uh, losses you can maintain. Um, in addition to that, you can have um, uh, your own independent insurance that you buy from an insurance organization. For example, we use Equisure, which is what the Scottish Terrier Club of America uses also. They cover rescue activities. There's also companies that just cover rescue uh, rescue activities for independent clubs, for example. Or any of these things can be purchased. So if it's going to cost me $3,000 a year for insurance, um, we need to be a, a group that's big enough to be able to maintain that kind of thing, or we've been in business long enough to maintain that kind of thing. So in the meantime, we use whatever pieces of it we can by using things like forms to relinquish liability. If somebody's going to meet a dog, if somebody's going to adopt a dog, um, uh, you can uh, have certain levels of insurance and then uh, you can just add on to it as you have more money. Okay, um, I think that's our last question, Vicki. So I guess um, we've run over a little bit, of course, uh, too much talking on my part, but if are there any questions, I think there's a maybe turn it over to Matt if there's a QA and a um, section. If anybody's asked questions, maybe they can let us know. So we do have the question in the chat. Sorry, let me look at that. Thank you. I can't hear you that well, Matt. Uh, we do have some questions in the chat. Uh, Carol is asking about rescue organizations offering transfer of the dog to their forever home, like if the forever home was in another state or meeting at a halfway point or something like that. We, we, we do the best that we can to work with adopters in other states. I think we're a little more far reaching than Erica's group is as far as placement, because we place dogs in California, we place dogs, you know, and actually in the Northeast or out, out in the East Coast, but it is the responsibility of the doctor uh, for financial costs on that. Um, we can generally, you know, we'll arrange a transport if we need to. Uh, we'll meet them halfway if we can. Um, one, of the, one of the ladies on the group, Nan from Illinois, uh, we have adopters from Chicago and Wisconsin all the time and we meet at her house in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, we transport, we have dogs fostered in Kansas City 
and we meet halfway between St. Louis and Kansas City to move dogs to get them further east. And um, we can use the uh, our our personal pilot, um, but you know the fuel cost is the responsibility of the person that adopts from us. But we'll work it out the best we can. Uh, we also had this is Michelle asked earlier who is it that does the actual testing? I'm guessing she's talking about like with other dogs or cats and behavioral things. Do all of your fosters do that or do you have certain team members that go and do that? I think that's Erica what, asked, asked Yeah, that's what that. I was just saying before. We, we, we do rely on our foster homes because they're living with the dog and they're observing things and testing things on our behalf. But um, often we will go and visit our dogs if it's you know um, uh, geographically possible. Uh, just to spend some time with them and meet them so that when we speak to the adopters or the applicants, um, we can be more accurate about their behavior and what they would expect when they meet them. So there's another question from Lori here about foster. Like, how do you decide if someone is good as a foster family? I'm guessing it's a lot of the same, same factors that you take into consideration for whether they'd be good at uh, taking in a Scotty full time. I couldn't really hear you that well, Matt. Sorry, I don't know what's going on. I can't adjust my oh. volume any higher. Oh, okay. um, no, it's getting just Michelle it out. Can jump in and do the questions. I don't know what's going on. I, my volume's as high as it'll go. Okay, no, that's that's good. You were going in and out a little bit. Um, when you what were you saying about- to the, to the your left, Matt, the mic picks you up much better. I'm sorry? When you I can't turn, hear you now. When you turn your head to the, to the your left, the mic picks you up much better. Okay, so the question was, how do you decide if someone is good as a foster family? Well, we do the Can same thing as we okay. do for our applicants. We do a home visit, we do the vet reference check, we, we talk to them, it's the same process as for somebody applying to adopt a dog. We have a we have a, a handful of foster homes that we use and basically that's all, those are the only volunteers we have right now. Um, occasionally we ask for new foster homes. Um, a lot of the time, by the time we get a dog in, they're not available anymore or they're not the right match for the fostering. They, they, they can't take, let's say an older dog or a younger dog or a male or a female or a sick dog or whatever. So, you know, we, we try to match them as much as possible to what they can offer uh, what would fit well for them. And also for me, keeping in mind that if they foster that dog and fall in love with the dog, I'd like them to be able to stay there if possible. Some rescue groups don't allow that fosters to adopt, um, but I do, because if they're happy and I don't want them to make another transition if they don't need to. Yeah, so I try to make sure that when I'm matching somebody who's gonna foster that it's gonna be somebody that if they wanted to keep them, they could. I think Vicki is probably going to address this, but there is something that's called a, um, a, a, a rescue failure where they end up staying with the fosters. That's all yeah, we have. Yeah, that's Nan's waving can. her hand. Nan has how many right now that she adopted from us for foster failure. We're happy, and I, and I have to admit, I am a little guilty sometimes of picking a foster home based on, hmm, that dog might end up staying there. So I do do that every once in a while. And sometimes we are the foster failures. Right, right, that happens too. Um, uh, I like to keep a slot open in my house for a permanent foster. I didn't really mention that in the presentation, but we have, I don't know, I didn't do a count. I think we have at least six permanent foster dogs in our organization right now, dogs that because of medical issues or whatever, they're not really what we deem adoptable. Um, they may be in a hospice situation. They may have a heart, uh, heart condition. We have a little Westie guy that we got in at about a year old that they don't ex didn't expect him to live beyond three and or four and he's still hanging in there he's had his fourth birthday but we do have permanent foster situations as well and and we have one in um central missouri right now i mean i think molly's about 15 years old and she's got issues and we have another a bonded pair that came in that the male has bladder cancer and some other issues 
And the female could be adopted out, but they're bonded. So we're keeping them together in a permanent foster home situation where the rescue foots the bills. We pay for the vetting, we pay for food, whatever the foster home needs, they provide the love and care for the rest of those dogs' lives. We have a bunch of, um, we have uh, two, two of our team foster homes that have multiple dogs in that are permanent fosters. They're not adoptable because they're biters or they're uh, elderly and sick, um, you know, blind or, I mean, not that blindness should stop the dog from being adopted, but with other multiple problems. Um, and, uh, and, and a thing to, to note is that we still foot the bill. We need a place to put those dogs or they would be put down. And they really deserve to have a good home and they're good with their foster families. We just can't trust and can maybe can't take the chance on the liability of placing those dogs. So we keep them in permanent foster and we make sure that they get, their, they get groomed, they get their vet care, they may get Apoquel for their allergies every day. They still cost money. Even if we have nobody in foster, those dogs are still costing us every day. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason that we're always out there working. You know, it looks like, oh yeah, we're having another auction. Yeah, but because we still have dogs we're paying for no matter what, even when all the glamorous ones are adopted. <laughs> so. There's a couple of questions here. I think from our conversation earlier this week, I think these are tied together. Um, somebody asked, what are dog auctions? And then Nan asked, can anyone expound on the transports and tractor trailers? And I think, we talked earlier this week about dog auctions. Those are kind of connected a little bit. Um, I can, I, I'm sure Vicki may want to address this and I, I couldn't hear the whole question, but I did hear about the transports. There are tractor trailers that are fitted for dogs to be transported long distances. And they're basically, you open up the door and you see it's all cages. You know, dogs are supposed to be transported with certificate of, what is it? Health certificates. Um, officially across state borders. So that means that dog has been to the vet, been vaccinated, and has been checked out to make sure they're healthy enough to make a trip like that because it's very stressful on the dogs. Um, and um, not a lot of places, well, I should say a lot of places don't do that. They just pick up dogs. They they troll all the shelters in the south, and they take everybody that they can. They think they can make a few dollars on, and they stick them in these tractor trailers and ship them up here. And a percentage of them die. They don't make it because they're too old. They can't stand the stress. They don't get food or air or whatever, you know. And you you hear these things on TV every once in a while that somebody was stuck on the side of the road and they went to check them out, and it's full of dogs. Oh, and the dogs are in the heat or the dogs are not being fed or they're not being walked or they're sitting in their own feces. I mean, it's just, you know, you're really better off just getting somebody from a reputable group. Yeah, we have used transport, um, transport companies. We've used them twice, but you have to make sure they're very reputable and you have to make sure of the type of care that they have and how they transport the dogs. You have to make sure that it's climate controlled, that, you know, if it's hot outside, it's cool inside where they're doing the dogs. You have to make sure that they stop frequently enough to, to you know, let the dogs out and, and take care of the situation. So we don't do it very often, but we have used a couple of groups um, the other question I think was what are dog auctions? Was that the question? Yes. Um, oh, auctions. Okay. Uh, dog auctions. Uh, we have a couple of really well-known ones here in Missouri that it's basically breeders bring dogs to auction houses and they bring the dog up and people bid on them. And a lot of the dogs end up going to other breeders, other puppy millers, and it's a whole big, long, um, conversation and probably not one that we want to get into now, um, but um, the auctions have changed over the years, and um, it used to just be an outlet for the breeders to get rid of their unwanted dogs for a few bucks, but it's, it's a big business now. It's a huge business for the auction houses now, very big business. 
And obviously, I just want to interject here when we talk about um, breeders wanting to get rid of their dogs, et cetera, those are typically puppy mills. Um, right. and, and again, we're not here to diss anyone, but that's why anyone who's looking to adopt a dog from rescue, be a part of a res rescue organization. Again, going back to both Erica and Vicki's um, comments, it's really important to take a look at that ethics um, and the scope of responsibility and the people in the leadership positions within those organizations and, and make sure you're doing, you know, you're following one that you believe in that is very committed. Um, there has been a lot of stuff posted on Facebook um, by some people about that there are res rescue, and I use that term in quotes, rescue organizations that are just flipping dogs and generating money. It's like another line of business. That kind of business is not what organizations like Erica and Vicky's, the ones that they lead, are involved with at all. But there are people out there that are rescue organizations that do that kind of work. And it's sort of like buyer, volunteer, supporter, just beware and and, and look out for things. There was one really other question. You really have to know. You really have to look into it. Just like what Michelle was saying. There are people that will go to a shelter and pick up a Scotty, let's say. They'll, maybe they'll pay $100 adoption fee. And then they'll go ahead and go on Facebook uh, and sell the dog for $400. So they've made $300. They haven't vetted the dog. They haven't checked their personality. They don't really care. They know that a Scotty's in demand so they can make a few dollars on it. And, and those people take the dogs away from people like us who, who can do better for the dog to find the, the right home and also to get them the medical care that they need. Um, uh, I, I want to just say something about the auctions. And like Vicki said, we could do a whole thing on just the auctions. But I've been approached over my years, I'm sure she has too. And uh, people will say they go to the auctions and there's a list put out before the auction of what's going to be in the auction. And let's say for Scotty's, there's going to be... <laughs> 20 of them. And they'll say there's going to be six males, two females, a couple of puppies, a couple of adults, two pregnant ones. They'll tell you what's going to be there. And they want you to, they want to know from you if you'll participate. They want money from you. They'll say to me, can you give me, let's say $2,000 and I, um, I will bid with your money on those dogs and try to get those dogs and get, and then I will get them to you. Or, you know, I don't know what they'll do with them, but eventually the dog would be intended to come to us for us to vet and groom and, um, and evaluate and find homes for. But we're essentially then buying the dogs. We, I'm not in the auction, but I'm giving somebody at the auction the money to get that dog for me. You know, it's, it's a difficult situation because what you're really doing is you're paying those puppy millers for those dogs. So it's a sales outlet. Rescue can be a sales outlet for those puppy millers. So they have no reason um, to stop breeding the dogs. So we're really supporting them. If in, and they actually compete against each other sometimes and make the price go up a lot more than they need to. So they're kind of still taking more, more of your money than you need to give them. So on, for, for ethical reasons and for reasons where we really don't want to continue supporting the puppy millers business and would like that to be legislated out preferably, we try not to support that kind of business. If somebody gives me a dog that came from a puppy mill, I will take them into my rescue program, just like any other. If the, if the breeder is going out of business, uh, my rescue colleague in Maryland just got eight from a puppy mill last week. The puppy mill, the, the, apparently the, the uh, puppy miller broke his back and he had eight dogs. So they all came to her and now she's, you know, vetting them and uh, grooming them. They're being spayed, and neutered, and vaccinated. One's got knee and knee surgery and there's a whole bunch of stuff that gets done. It's, it's gonna be about $10,000 worth of work. So she raises her money and then she comes to the Rescue Trust Fund and Scottish Terrier Club of America for some of that money to help finance taking care of those dogs as rescues and getting them ready to be adopted and to get onto a new life. 
So, you know, you have to decide as a rescuer what kind of, what your philosophy is gonna be. What are you gonna support? Are you gonna just take puppies from puppy mill and only puppies and not a place adult dogs that need your help? Anybody will buy a puppy or take a puppy. You, it's, the dog, it's the dogs that are adults that need your help. You know, that's, those are the people that we need to intervene with. Thank you, Erica, for your honesty with, with that issue. Um, we have one last question that I'm just gonna pose or put out to you that's sort of a combination of somebody asking, do you work with XYZ Rescue, XYZ organization, particularly in Colorado? And so I would just ask you to address that. Um, um, excuse me. To what degree do you collaborate with non-Scotty specific rescues? Um, is there an open door kind of relationship, or um, how to, how is that worked for you? As far as I'm concerned, we'll work with anybody that wants to get a Scotty to us. It doesn't matter if if they if they got Scotties in need, we'll help out. It it. I, I work with other organizations all the time as much as I can. Um, I used to, I don't have as much time now. I used to transport other breeds just because a lady from Pug Rescue got me a Scotty um, and, and you know picked up the Scotty for me. So I started transporting pugs to help that group out. So I think it's, you know, if, if they're willing to work with us, I'm happy to work with anybody that needs help with Scotties. It doesn't matter. I don't know who specifically in Colorado like this this group. I don't I don't personally know any uh, group that I work with in Colorado other than the Colorado Scotty Rescues um, uh, people that are, are doing it that are on our STCA website uh, list. Um, I, I don't think National Mill Dog Rescue has really reached out to Scotty. Yeah, I, yeah, I never heard of them. Uh, personally, I never heard of them. But like Vicki said, uh, we will work with anybody who's not a Scotty. If there's a, a, a group in a different state, sometimes another breed rescue picks up a Scotty, we'll still contact them. They may want to place the dog. I'm not sure, but um, uh, we'll work with any of them. On the re SDCA rescue list, I'm listed and many of the others are listed under ones where the states where there's no volunteers. So if somebody calls in, um, I don't even remember. Um, uh, Nevada. We don't have a person in Nevada. So um, my name is listed there. So I get calls from the people from Nevada who want to adopt and calls from people in Nevada who want to turn dogs in. So what I typically do is I will leverage our, leverage our, net, our rescue network and say, who's closest? Who can I pay for a plane flight to pick up a dog? Who can I pay for? A how, how, do I have anybody on Facebook I'm friends with who could pick that dog up and bring them to the next closest state where there's a rescuer? Or can they foster the dog and I can place the dog from there? I can make sure they get to the vet and the groomer and get all these things done, evaluated, and then I can put out on my pet finder, let's say, or on my Facebook page that I've got a dog in Nevada that has these characteristics and I'm looking for this. And so, you know, we can do that from anywhere. So that's what we usually do, multiple states anyway. So... I mean, I will work with anybody again who will do that. And uh, there are also, uh, this might be have been the, the, uh, the focus of that question. I'm not positive. But um, if, let's say, Colonel Potter Cairn Rescue or CRUSA, um, somebody on here was uh, working at, uh, with uh, Cairn Rescue USA or um, Cairn Rescue League, uh, if those people call, contact me and ask me, I do home visits for Colonel Potter all the time. Um, I, we, we even foster dogs for them sometimes. We even help place dogs for them sometimes. We do transports for them. So we work with a lot of Cairn rescue groups. We work with a lot of Westie rescue groups, similar breed rescues. And, and like, like uh, uh, Vicki said, you never know if somebody's gonna have a dog that's one of yours, that they're gonna have a relationship with you and you're gonna get that dog. You help them, they help you. I mean, if you can do it, if you have the time and you have the money and you have the room, there's no reason not to help. I, I fostered a corgi not too long ago. Um, and, and I developed a relationship with corgi rescue in New York and that was wonderful. So the longer I do this before I drop dead, um, I, I may you know, have somebody in, in many breed rescues. So, um, and it's a great thing. It's a great thing. You learn from everybody. 
And you never know, we had somebody Boykin rescue. We had somebody pick up a couple of Boykins for Boykin rescue. And now like we're friendly with them, you know? So I hadn't even heard of that before. I never even heard of that breed before. Turns out they're a great breed, you know? So I have one final question for both of you. Um, in previous uh, collaborations with people who've done Scotty rescue a while back, um, they certainly were, um, were honest about the high risk for burnout. How do you guys prevent that for yourselves personally, as well as for the teams that work with you? You want to say, you want to answer that? I don't, I don't know how to answer it. I think it probably just boils down to the love of those pointy ear dogs. If I haven't been doing it as long as Erica has, but it's, it's in the blood. It's, it's the passion that if I'm not doing it, who's gonna, who's gonna do it. I'm very, very fortunate to have such a huge network of, of helpers. Very fortunate in that aspect that, you know, they help build me up. I can gripe to them when I want to gripe to them. I can say I'm tired of calling people back on the phone. Um, you know, because like Erica said, you can get a ton of phone calls and then people get mad because you don't answer them right away. And, <laughs> and people get mad because you didn't pick them to adopt a dog that you have. And that part is emotionally taxing. That's hard, a hard having to deal with. It's, I love dealing with the dogs. It's the people that make it a little more challenging sometimes, but at least I'm fortunate to have a very good support system. Thank you. And I have I have a smaller support system than Vicky's. I you know, I hope when I grow up one day I have a bigger one. But um, I definitely think that that's a big key part of it. I have a small team, but they are the best people. We're friends, we're on the phone, we're on Facebook pages like just between us every day, day and night. We, you know, we have a lot of laughs. We, we enjoy doing things together. It's not always fun. Obviously the, you know, bringing in the dogs that are sick or dying, or, or it, it's not fun, but um, it, you know, it does help to have that rest, that network. And who says I'm not burnt out? I could have burnt out years ago and I'm still functioning on burnout. <laughs> but somehow it's working, so. Yeah. Well, hopefully um, today's presentation has helped energize the two of you. Um, I'm going to get cheerful here, but in my opinion, nobody does this better than the two of you in your team. So Aww, on behalf thanks. of all of us, thank you so much, not only for today, but for the thousands of hours of work you and your teams put together and put into helping our dogs. I do have a quick comment. Somebody popped up earlier and said, what about the dog in Bolivar, Missouri? I emailed them this morning. I'm waiting to hear back. <laughs> I just want to thank you also for responding so generously to our request for this um, presentation and um, express my huge admiration for both of you. I've known Erica for decades and Vicki for less long, but my admiration and love for both of you is unbounded. Thank you so much. Well. Thank you. I, I, I think it was a privilege to be asked to do this and to work with, alongside with Vicki, who's obviously one of our best uh, rescuers in the country. So, um, you know, thank you all very much. And thank you to Door County for, for um, also doing this because people are learning a lot from these, um, these things. So, and we are also a recipient of grants from Door County and um, it's very generous and very helpful and they do things very ethically. So I really do appreciate them and I hope that everybody will support them and continue to support them. Because we also benefit from you supporting them. So we all do. So, and the dogs do most of all. All right, so, you guys. Um, I'm gonna call this a wrap. We've gone uh, quite a bit over, but it's been very <laughs> worth it. Um, we will um, post announcements of when uh, this video is going to be available on our DCSR YouTube channel. So watch for that announcement on Facebook. Thank you again to everyone. And now for sure, we'll see you in January at our next Zoomie. Thanks for coming. Thank you Thank so much. You.